Hi, this is Eric Schlein. You're listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast. And today we have on Shana Sissel, who is the Chief Investment Officer at Spotlight Asset Group. Shana, welcome so much to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So where, where are you right now? I am just outside of Chicago in Evanston, Illinois. Most people, if they've never heard of it, if I tell them that Northwestern is here, then they know exactly where it is. But we're just north of Chicago, right on the lake. Are you, are you from this area? I'm not. I grew up in the Boston area. Actually, I grew up in a city called Worcester. If you're from the Worcester. Northeast, you've heard of, yeah. If you're from the Northeast, you've heard of Worcester yeah. uh, because it's on the signs on 95 when you head north. Uh, it's the second largest city in New England. It's bigger than Hartford and Providence. But unless you're from the Northeast, you probably have not heard of it. Have you ever been to, I think it's called New Cafe, NU? It's like my favorite cafe in Worcester. I don't know that place, and I'm shocked because I thought I knew all the good places in it's Worcester, like but it has been a cafe. Since I'm... Yeah. So. Very cool. Yeah. Well, then next time I'm home, I'll have to check it out. There, there you go. So, so tell us a little bit about what you do. Um, so you work for Spotlight Asset Group. You're chief investment officer. It's kind of a big role. Um, and you, you know, I, we were talking before the show that you do a lot with like alternative investments. How did you, you know, tell us a little bit about I. I think that's probably very interesting for the show. So I'd, tell us a little bit about that and how you got into it uh, and, and what is an alternative investment? Sure. So I'll start with your first question. I am the chief investment officer at Spotlight Asset Group. I joined the firm in April. Uh, my story of how I got there is sort of become a little social media legend. Well, I, let's, let's hear it. I tweeted that I had been laid off from my job at Orion uh, Advisor Solutions. And within 24 hours, I was inundated with direct messages with people who had opportunities for me. One of them uh, was Steve Greco, the CEO of Spotlight, uh, saying that they had been looking for a chief investment officer for quite some time and that I seemed like I would be a perfect fit for the role. And two weeks later, I was starting in the middle of a quarantine, uh, my new job at Spotlight. I'm responsible for uh, the model portfolios, I lead the investment policy committee and the investment committee. I write commentaries for the clients. I do uh, quarterly client and sometimes monthly client market update calls. I help do a lot of the analytical work on the portfolio, searches for new managers. You name it, I do it uh, if it has to do with investing for sure, the portfolios and how we're going to invest our client money. In terms of my alternatives background, so much like my entire life at this point, I got into it by accident. I got into finance by accident too. That's uh, that's kind of where what's, I was coming from with that little what's, joke. What's that about? How did you get into finance by accident? I have an undergraduate degree in sport management. And so I thought I was going to be a sideline reporter for either Major League Baseball or the NFL. Not, not I'd too been far working... off from alt investments. No, right? not at all. No. <laughs> I thought I would... Uh, be doing that. I was working for the New England Sports Network my senior year of college the entire time, driving that two and a half hour drive to Boston every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so that's what I thought I was going to do. But it didn't, it wasn't really working out. I was working for a staffing agency as I was trying to uh, find the right opportunity in the sports field. This was how long so ago? I, uh, 2000. So imagine in, ima imagine in 2000, someone tells you it's the year 2020. You're a chief investment officer of a company and all sports are canceled. I know. <laughs> it would have been crazy yeah. uh, if you think about it. Right? Absolutely. So I, anyway, and yeah, yeah. So anyways, yeah. I was working for a staffing agency as an account manager and we had an account with Morgan Stanley to find them new financial advisors for their um, entry level financial advisor role. And we had sent them 20 people and had nobody hired. So my boss, knowing they didn't know who I was and I was young enough to be a realistic candidate for the role, uh, sent me an undercover and huh. I ended up getting the job and they offered me a lot more money than I was making at the staffing agency, which quite frankly, Looking back at it is kind of funny. I was making like twenty seven thousand at the staffing agency, and I think they were offered me thirty one. To me, that was a ridiculously uh, large amount of money considering you know what I was making. So I took the job, 
no intention to stay in the business. It was just, I can make a little more money and keep looking for the right job in the sports world. Uh, but I ended up falling in love with it, but didn't want to be an advisor. So wanted to get into something more analytical and went to school and got my MBA. So that was how I accidentally got into finance. How I accidentally got into alternatives was after I got my MBA, I really wanted to be a stock analyst. I really wanted to have coverage, work on the buy side, help pick stocks. And I was interviewing for all these jobs and I couldn't get hired for any of those positions because I didn't go to a good enough school. When you're in Boston, everybody wants you to have gone to Harvard or MIT. Right. Uh, and I, I went to a great school, but it was not Harvard or MIT. So I just started applying for analyst positions with large asset managers, not in Boston. And one of them was Russell Investments mm. and it was for their hedge fund of fund team. So I knew nothing about that. I was coming entirely from the long only buy side at Fidelity. I had essentially grown up to that point thinking hedge funds were evil. Okay. Shorts, people who short stocks, those people they're are really not. They're evil, right? Yeah. Yes, they're evil. They're just trying to manipulate the markets, work their own books, all of those things. Hedge fund managers just exploit people to make as much money as possible. You know, all so the So you grew up with types. all of that mythology. Yes. Got it. So when I went and interviewed at Russell for this hedge fund of fund position, I just was looking to get into an analytical role and knew nothing about hedge funds and alternatives. And then they hired me, not because I was probably the most qualified person for the job or knew anything about what I would be doing, but because I understood and was extremely proficient in using a specific software system that's impossible to teach people on. And they didn't want to have to have somebody that they were going to have to train on it because it would take six months to, to get them up and running. And so they hired me. What's, and what's, and what's that software system? It's MPI Stylus, which is sort of like Zephyr on steroids, but it's so open architecture that back then it was much harder to use than it is today. Okay. But it's still not the easiest program to use if you've never used it before, if you're going to have somebody come in and just need to, them to get started right away. And that's your primary analytical tool. Yeah. Uh, so it. that's why they hired me. And I felt like my eyes were opened to alternatives at that time. I kind of started to understand their benefits, how they work, why people would want to invest in them. But more importantly, we're talking about just before the financial crisis. So we're talking 2007. And we that group was already seeing issues with liquidity and some of their le least liquid hedge fund managers not being able to liquidate their positions. And they're kind of the canaries in the coal mine. When hedge funds start to have trouble, that's usually a leading indicator of what's going on in the market. So they have a lot of value. And I became obsessed with learning everything I could. And since then, I've made my mark in my career by being an alternatives expert as the industry has shifted more and more into making alternatives more part of portfolio construction. You, it, this was before liquid alts were a thing. There was no such thing as liquid alts then. That came maybe a year or two later. Okay. So I was on the leading edge and that's been the story of my career from the beginning. I mean, I got clients as a financial advisor because I made myself a 529 expert and that was right when the 529 legislation uh, was passed and, and 529 accounts were a thing. So alternatives and being on the leading edge of it from the beginning has been good for my career. And so I have leveraged that as much as possible. Interesting. So now let's fast forward today and you specializing in alternatives. Tell, tell us, tell the listeners a little bit about when you say alternatives, what, what you mean by that? Anything that is not long only equity or fixed income. Okay. It's a very, very broad category. Mm -hmm. Everything falls into it. Um, commodities, managed futures, long, short hedge funds, um, illiquid, um, lending kind of funds that are out there, private equity, venture capital, all of that would fall into the alternatives bucket. The only one that is somewhat debatable is real estate. Okay. Uh, I don't consider REITs an alternative because they are publicly traded on the exchanges and part of the indices, but physical real estate, if you were to go out and invest in a fund that buys physical real estate, that's not a read that would be considered an alternative. So they kind of, 
that's a little bit of a debatable area of what is an alternative. It's a lot easier to define what isn't an alternative than what is. Right. Well, it would be like stocks, bonds, right? Like all that. Anything. Yes. Right. Long only. Right. So it's not just what you're investing in, but also the strategies you okay. use to make those investments. Now, is there, is there anything today in the, the grand world of alternatives that you think you're seeing opportunity that's, you know, especially in some subsector of an alternative, do you see specific opportunity? So it depends on what you're looking at. Alternatives have a huge place in allocations today because they serve as a really good way of managing risk. Mm -hmm. In the liquid alternative space, it's really their primary role because the restrictions of the 40 Act make it very difficult to have a lot of excess return generated. But the uh, underlying what's, strategies. What's the 40 Act? So the 40 Act is the legislation that um, essentially creates the structure and the rules for mutual funds, ETFs, anything that's in a, it's called a 40 Act fund. Mm -hmm. uh, closed end funds would also fall into that category. They have regulatory restrictions on how they can invest, what they can invest in, uh, how much liquidity they have to offer. Um, the whole bunch how of constraints. The, yeah, a ton of constraints that they have to file additional regulatory documentation. If you go to SEC Edgar, you can pull up all the different filings that have to be done by 40 Act funds. So alternative 40 Act funds, specifically those that can short, kind of came into existence with in 2007, 2008, when the SEC broadened the investment um strategy that can be used in uh, a 40 act fund prior to that shorting was not really something you could do in a 40 act but if you recall right around that time is when 130 30 funds showed up and tell the listeners what that is so a 130 30 fund is when the fund can be net long 130 percent so that means that they have a hundred percent in equity and then they use margin to leverage the portfolio so that they can short 30% of the for portfolio. So then you have 100 minus 30, that's um, 70. And then they can use that additional 30% of leverage from the shorts to go long an additional 130. So net, they are 100% right. exposed to the market, but they have this shor shorting component that allows them to go a little extra long and have that short position. So that's what a 130-30 fund is. That means it's 130% long and 30% 30 short. short. And that's out to 100. Yes, and it's supposed to be beta of one. And that's the, the benefit is supposed to be that you can have that short position to leverage a long position to put more money in your best ideas. And how often but does it work out? that it's a beta of one? Uh, they tend to stick around beta oh, one or okay. slightly higher. It's very rare for a 130-30 fund to have a less than one beta, whereas in a more traditional mutual fund or ETF, you'll see betas under one, just the nature of having that cash position, yeah. as well as conservatively investing certain into certain stocks and that manager uh, taking those... Uh, active bets will sometimes bring it under one as well, depending on its benchmark, of course. But 13030 funds kind of came into existence in 2007. And that was because the SEC broadened um, the guidelines and how a mutual fund could invest, but it still limits the amount of leverage and amount of shorting that a mutual fund can do. So it'll never truly be like a hedge fund, which does not have the same limitations. Got it. And what is the, what is the day to day you know, day-to-day -day in the life of you at work, what is your research process? Like, there's so much to look at in, in the alt space specifically. Well, in the alt space, I spend a lot more time in the liquid alt space these days mm -hmm. because it's broader. It's easier to find the information you need. Morningstar is obviously got a wealth of the universe Lipper and, and the like. One of the downsides of the private vehicles, the traditional, as people know them traditionally hedge funds is that if you are not a registered fund under the 40 act you cannot actively go out and market so we have to find them and not the other way around okay. so it's a lot harder in this quarantine environment when i'm not able to go to conferences and i'm not able to network the way i would want to uh to find hedge funds so as we're getting our portfolios 
constructed today and looking for ways to hedge, we're dealing mostly in the 40X space. I'm lucky in that I know that space very well from my previous role at Orion. Uh, I helped manage the alternatives model portfolio there. And so I'm very familiar with what's out there. And so from a research perspective, we're just keeping in touch with what's out there, what the universe looks like, and looking at our portfolios and making sure that we have the exposures we want, and we're taking the risk that we want. And alternatives play a huge role in helping us mitigate the risk in the portfolio. So it's a lot, it really is a lot of networking. It, in the private fund face, yeah. uh, space, absolutely. It, there's no way to find out what's out there in the hedge fund world unless you subscribe to these very expensive databases or you know people. And you, the key to finding good hedge funds is the cap intro that the prime brokers do. So most major investment banks, whether it be Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs have prime brokerage divisions. And these are the divisions that work with the hedge funds to help them maintain their accounts, their margin accounts, and provide them with the credit they need to, to do the strategies that they're implementing. And those prime brokers also coordinate massive quarterly and usually one huge annual prime uh, what they call them capital introduction conferences where they invite all their hedge funds to come and just pitch to investors. And that's one of the primary ways that you find hedge funds out there, uh, especially up and coming and in the private fund space, size matters. Smaller funds do tend to do better because once you get to a certain size, strategies are harder to implement at scale. Uh, it's not across the board, but with a lot of hedge fund strategies, that's true. That makes sense. And so going to those conferences is the key to finding those private funds that you would want to consider for your client. There are other large uh, conferences like Skybridge does the SALT conference annually in Las Vegas. That's an excellent conference what, what to is find. That? Uh, Skybridge does, it's, SALT stands for Skybridge Alternatives. Now, SALT is no longer just alternatives, but I've gone to that conference, I would say 80% of the time that it's been around. It started in 2007. Okay. And it is by far one of the best conferences, investment conferences in general. But if you're looking for the alternative managers that are out there, it's a great place for that because not just the managers that attend, but other attendees or large endowments, foundations from across the world, from the Middle East, from Asia, they all come to Las Vegas to meet with these managers. And you get to hear from the brightest minds in the business. So you have Gerlach, I've seen him speak there. Um, you have um, Citadel, uh, their their founder sp speaks. You have Ackman spoke the last time I was there. We had Bernanke. Everybody you would ever want to hear in the finance world is on their agenda. So it's a great conference in general if you're into investments, but if you're in the alternative space, it's also a tremendous conference to network because everyone in the world that matters is there. Now, maybe some of the smaller conferences, have you ever heard a pitch that was just like absolutely ridiculous do you ever see those at all yeah you see them quite a bit from especially from up-and-coming managers because right. anybody can start a hedge fund right because sure. you don't have to file anything or there's no regulatory so you'll see these people who just like graduated from college or have no business no pedigree who start these ridiculous funds and think that they have something special and they have no background, no pedigree and no return history. Yep. Uh, and they think that people are going to give them money. And to their credit, some people do. Uh, but I, I do find those pitches amusing. What was, uh, was, and I, what's, what's like the funniest pitch you've ever heard where you just like almost couldn't contain yourself from laughing? I don't know if there's any that's that memorable. It's okay. usually, I think there's one that I do recall. It was a kid who hadn't, didn't finish college, did not have his licenses, but had been managing money for his family and thought he was just the best small cap investor ever. Okay. He had no track record. He had like one stock that worked and he really thought he was going to get a lot of money for this strategy. And since then he's changed his pitch a number of times from small caps to record label, um, copyrights to cannabis, He's just trying to gather money. Record however. label copyrights. 
Yes. Is that where you like your own rights to a song and you get royalties? Yes. Interesting. That that is a thing. I, I, uh, I, but I, in this yeah. particular occasion, I've, I've done a, case, I've, I, we did an episode on a Mills Music Trust. Okay. Yeah. So that that's a private vehicle that would be considered a quote unquote hedge fund. In- interesting. Very so. Huh. Yeah. So you hear some of that stuff. I've heard somebody who had classic antique violins that was opening a fund. And Interesting. The, the, the fund would invest in violins. Yes. Huh. So, so you hear a lot of stuff. How do you even um, measure the value of that on a uh, quarterly or annual basis? I have no idea. <laughs> and clearly the liquidity was very limited. Right. And I don't, how do you, and is there a way to scale that? I don't believe so. (laughs) But there are things out there that are interesting investments. For example, asset based lending is one of the really interesting areas and that you can really only get exposure through, through hedge funds. So these are people that lend to companies who, you know, have problems in the traditional banking markets and they use collateral as like their office desks, the chairs they sit in. Yeah. Um, the computers they have in their office, that would be the collateral. Those are also very hard to have uh, daily liquidity and to measure the value of. Uh, but those can be very successful funds because they have a lien on essentially all the physical assets that the company has that they're lending to. And they are first in line in terms of being able to collect on that. So right. they're very liquid, but they certainly have great returns because typically those are startup companies that probably have some really something really interesting for whatever reason venture capital isn't interested in giving them money or they're just too small or in such a niche market that they don't have angels. So there's all sorts of ways to play in the private sp- fund space. And people usually think of hedge funds as just long, short yeah. equity, but it's varied um, in how you can do that. And only a small percentage of hedge fund strategies can actually be replicated in a, in a 40 act form. I'm laughing before about the violin thing. I'm still thinking about that, but I think it's like, if someone could pull that off and have an edge and rare violins, like more mm-hmm. power to them, I think that's actually kind of cool. And artwork's another one. Yeah. Rare art where people you're buying into a fund that invests in rare art. And if you do have, that's a little bit easier to get an idea of the value of each art, piece of art because you can have Sotheby's or whatever come in and do that. And then they're constantly auctioning off pieces and that's where you're getting your cash flows from. But it, it's very um, interesting from that perspective, um, all the different ways that you can invest in that private fund world. Hey, I actually have a friend who's an art dealer. I was talking to him a few weeks ago and he certainly has an edge in, in being able to find, mm-hmm. uh, you know, good pieces of art. And to my knowledge, at least his track record is pretty good. So yeah. it doesn't surprise me that there's stuff like that out there. What other, what, what other interesting things have you seen bes- if you have besides violins and, and rare art? I can't say that there's been anything more obscure than that okay. kind of okay, thing. Okay, we kind of hit the, the, the edge on Yeah, that. The, those are some of the more unique strategies that are out there. The royalties on uh, record and song royalties, um, violins, art, those kind of things. How about uh, those like, are the like litigation funds? Have you ever seen pitches for I, that? Those are far more common, believe it or not. And those actually can come out in a 40 act format Hmm. they do exist those are interesting because you're buying out a litigation and they're basically paying somebody their settlement at a discount based on what they're going to get later those are interesting but to me they always feel a little like i have to take a shower not that there's anything wrong with them and they're very profitable and i can see why people be interested in them but in many ways you're they're buying out people's life insurance policies and like waiting for them to die or somebody got in a car accident and they really need the settlement money now for medical bills and so you're taking advantage of somebody's bad luck to make money. So while they're very profitable and they're totally above board and they're very common, uh, for me, they just make me like morally uncomfortable. I I can completely get that for sure. So, um, for someone who is an individual investor and wants to Mm -hmm. get more, you know, at least even allocate a portion of their portfolio 
to something that isn't necessarily correlated to the market and Mm -hmm. something alternative. What advice would you give someone like that? Well, I certainly think that anybody who's looking to add alternatives to their portfolio needs to be working with a professional. Alternatives are complicated. There's no way around that. And even advisors that I speak to or talk to at conferences will come up and be like, no matter how much I understand the value of alternatives, I just struggle to implement them in portfolio construction because I just don't want to have to answer all the questions because I don't have good answers. And I just would prefer to put my clients in things where I'm not going to be constantly asked about them. So So it is difficult. So here's the the question would be, how does someone discern from your point of view? Because this is something Mm -hmm. I deal with actually as an investment manager. Sure. What is, how do you, how would you say the individual can discern who actually knows what they're doing in the alt space, as opposed to someone that just has a fancy presentation with lots of fancy numbers and, you know, it sounds really complicated because a lot of it is. So from the standpoint of finding an advisor that you can work yeah. with, there is a designation out there. I, I actually hold it. It's the Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst designation, otherwise known as Kaya. That okay. is a designation similar to the CFA, which s- says that this person is highly skilled and knowledgeable about alternatives. They have to take multiple exams, very difficult exams on the universe of alternatives and everything that that comes with portfolio construction, derivatives, uh, fixed income and the like. And they've passed that test and it has a similar pass rate to the CFA. It is a rare designation, but people who have that designation, I would say feel very comfortable that they know what they're doing when it comes to alternatives in terms of if you're just going to a presentation and listening to a portfolio manager, the general rule of thumb that you hear about anything is if it seems too good to be true, it probably is is a good rule of thumb and alternatives. I know people from 2008, 2009 who invested in Madoff and I know that my firm passed on Madoff. Why was that? Well, because it fell into the, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And if you can't, we couldn't uh, deconstruct the return uh, stream. So we weren't able to replicate it or figure out how he was achieving the returns he, he was stating. And as a result, we decided to pass. And then if you read, and I'm a nerd, so I read it, Harry Markopoulos' letter to the SEC where he compared what Madoff was doing to other strategies out there like the Gateway Fund, which is a covered call writing strategy uh, that is actually a 40-act fund, um, that there was no way if he was doing what he said he was doing that he could have achieved those returns and then when you compare it to somebody who was doing exactly what he said he was doing, but getting a completely different return stream. So that's where, again, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, if it seems overly complicated and the manager is not willing to answer your questions about the complexity, then it is probably something you should pass on. Uh, alternatives are complicated in themselves, but I've yet to meet a manager that's above board that runs a quality shop that, that cares about, making sure that they're implementing their process and discipline correctly that won't take the time to try to explain to a prospect or client as best he can the complexity. Sometimes it's not possible, but you want somebody who at least is willing to try. Okay. Got it. Interesting. Do you, um, do you got, do you happen to know a guy by the name of Don Chambers? The name is familiar, but I, so I just had, I just interviewed him on my podcast. Uh, like mm-hmm. a few months ago, he um, he wrote the book called. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. It's the it's a thousand page book called Alternative Investments by by Wiley. Okay. So anyway, he he's he's written a lot of the uh, standards on alternative investments. I may have used his book when I got the Kaya. I think a more palpable easier to digest book yep. on alternatives that's worth reading is Larry Swedrow's uh, Black Swan's book. Okay. Um, that is a book about alternatives and how to implement them in portfolio construction, which is easier to digest and it's not a thousand pages. Yeah, this is very academic stuff that he wrote. Yes, yeah. so Larry Swedrow's book is not... Like he's, uh, he's literally writing the standards for the test that people take yes. for the alternative, yeah. which he also described as as hard as a CFA designation. It is. It is. It's more specialized. So for me, it was easier. But um, it is 
equally as difficult for sure. Um, but I do believe I had to read his book when I was studying for the Kaya all those years ago. Pro pro according to him, you probably would have because he yes. literally, apparently he wrote literally the standards like years ago for alt. Very cool. Um, yeah, he's an older guy. He does. He he runs a company, or he's he's the chief investment officer of a company called Biltmore Capital. But then he does, I am familiar like, with uh, Biltmore. So he does. He's the chief yeah. investment officer there, and then he does individual activism on his own. Very cool. Yeah. Activism it, is another thing that tends to fall into the hedge fund space. You know, it's interesting how you know I've been doing this podcast now for three years, and um, every once in a while I get someone on who's like, "Oh, you do you know this?" I've actually now have been connecting guests to each other. <laughs> Oh, see, you've been doing it long enough that now, you know, it's like, it's like setting people up on blind dates. Real, it's like, I'm an investment, I'm a financial matchmaker in a sense. There you are. And I have to say though, Twitter, I mean, shout out to Twitter. The, I mean, we wouldn't be talking if it wasn't for Twitter. You yep. would not have your job if it wasn't for Twitter. I mean, it's, it, it's amazing that that platform that's, you know, on the surface is you have 140 characters to type something is now leading to all these amazing uh, interactions. A lot, well, it's of, a lot of terrible interactions too, but a lot yes. of really wonderful interactions. So I've been a member of Twitter since 2009, and it was my least favorite social media platform for most of the time I've been on it. I also started in 2009. I thought it was garbage. Okay. Yeah. Yes, complete. And I really just used it because breaking news more often than not would come up on Twitter before it would come up anywhere else. Yep. And so that, that was really how I leveraged it. And it was kind of fun because you could interact with people who were so far out of your like stratosphere of networking and they might respond. It was great for complaining to companies about their, you know, things they were doing wrong and getting responses immediately. Yep. But I would say about two years ago, I sort of discovered FinTwit. Yep. And once I did that, I stopped following anything that was political in any way and just focused on FinTwit. And since I did that, my entire experience has changed. It's I, I a completely different. I think we're part of, I think you're in this boat of a bunch of us that yes. like we discovered there's actually this interesting community on Twitter that actually has something valuable to contribute. Exactly. And the coolest thing about it is really that community could not exist on any other platform. No at all can't really be on LinkedIn or Facebook. It would never really work. It wouldn't even work on a message board. No, it wouldn't. And so it, it really works in that community. And it's so interesting to me because I get, I've gotten podcast invites, television appearance invites, speaking at conferences and just built my network. And since I discovered FinTwit, my following has gone up immensely yep. and the amount of interactions that I get on my tweets is huge. And it's really been great for me to be able to lead, leverage and build my personal brand. People know who I am now. And even if I have never met them, the financial community in general, the financial advisors know who I am because of my Twitter profile. And that's pretty cool. And there's an underlying group of women that are members of FinTwit. And the way that that group of women supports each other is actually quite remarkable. And in the world of finance, women are a minority. So it's nice to have such an empowering group of women to sort of interact with where you're not being competitive at all. Yep, that's but awesome. the men are like that too. Like there's during this quarantine, they've been doing FinTwit poker tournaments really? and raising money for charity. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. You got to follow fed speaks. He's been coordinating most of that. D um, DM but, me anything interesting that you think I should yes. follow. Well, absolutely. I will do that. But, and some of the biggest names on FinTwit are participating in these events and these activities. And, you know, I remember the day Cliff Asnes started following me on Twitter. It was like, I have made it. I have made it. Jim Shaughnessy follows me, yep, and I, I felt yep. like I was a rock star. I, and I have watched interactions between the two of you. Yes. And it's cool because you're getting to interact and... with these amazing mentors and incredibly legendary members of the financial community, and they gain as much from interacting with you as you gain from interacting with them. And that's really the power of that FinTwit community. I would actually say it's the original intent of social media. Yes, I would agree. Actually bringing people together. Exactly. That's awesome. It's a super supportive group. Yeah. I would not be 
CIO of Spotlight Asset Group without them. And I would not have invited you onto my podcast without Fintoid as well. Exactly. And it's interesting what you said too about the branding. Mm -hmm. Because it was seeing a lot that you were contributing on Fintoit. And it was, oh, this person has something to contribute to the community. They're interesting. And it wasn't even, and you know, as you remember, it wasn't even necessarily about alternative investments. I was like, what do you think is interesting to talk about with the idea that you're just interesting to bring stuff to the table? Not necessarily that of like, hey, you do alt investments. Let me bring you on. And I've done that actually with a few people now um, where they're just, they have interesting things to actually contribute on Twitter. And I'll say, I think you'd be fun to have on the podcast. And what would you like to talk about? And mm-hmm. I, it, it's awesome how that how that's worked out. Yeah, the power of that community is immense. And there, you know, there's always the people on the outside that don't like it because it feels a little like a special group, and maybe they don't feel included. But I think, broadly speaking, I think the vast majority. I find it pretty I, oh, I agree completely. But we do tend to come to each other's defense a little aggressively sometimes, <laughs> um, and I think that that's you know. That's where that comes from. But I actually appreciate that. You know, we we stand up for each other. We are willing to disagree with each other. Uh, and we share not just about what's going on in finance, but we share some of our lives. And sometimes that can be equally as helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I share a lot about my like paleo and carnivore diet. I know you share mm-hmm. you're doing a pageant. Right. I did a pageant. Did a yes. Pageant. I just got back from Tennessee. I am self quarantined here in Evanston right now because I was in Tennessee. But uh, we were quarantined essentially down there anyways, so we weren't out in the community uh, that much. But uh, yeah, I just got back and it was a really interesting experience. And it's funny because most of my career I didn't want to talk about pageantry because there's such aggressive and negative stereotypes associated with it. But I came to a point where I stopped caring. Mm -hmm. uh, And it's just part of who I am. And I've been pleasantly surprised with how much support I've gotten from the community, even from people I would never have expected to get it from. Because it's part of who I am. And quite frankly, I wouldn't be nearly as successful as I am today had I not started competing in pageants when I was 15 years old. Oh, well, well, look, if if someone's going to judge you for that, then fuck them. Exactly. Yeah. How, How did it go? Uh, it went okay. I I did the best that I could have. I was really happy. I thought I did really well in my interview. I was ex- I wouldn't change anything. Everything okay. I did, I was in the best shape that I could have been in. I've certainly competed before and been like, I didn't work out as much as I should, and that's what killed me. I didn't feel that way this time. My wardrobe was on point. My interview was on point. They just were going in a different direction this year so that I was not the logical choice. Uh, I was more in line with the types of people who had won in the past and they clearly were going in a different direction. But the woman who won is amazing. uh, Well-deserved. She's competed multiple times in the past. And And what, uh, and what, what was it that you were going for? So the, this particular organization, so when you compete in a pageant, you're, you got to think about it as you're, you're competing to represent the brand for a year, right? So it helps you promote yourself, promote your social platform, In my case, it was financial literacy for women in the underserved minority communities. Uh, And but you have to fit their brand because they're advertising with you. You're going out and representing the brand at events. And so typically Mrs. International has been, for lack of a better word, a bombshell with a little bit of sex appeal, but very articulate and very much. Uh, in the community, she tends to be in a 30 to 50 range. They tend not, not that they've never, so they tend to always go for the person who's just very, very high profile, has a very specific look and they've traditionally not, um, crowned blondes, um, And the winner this year was blonde, but she's still beautiful. She's just a different look than had been crowned in the past. And I think that's great. It it shows people that it's more inclusive and that you don't have to fit a very specific mold to win. Uh, And in the current environment where you can't really travel, which is a huge component of what they're doing, she has a huge social media brand. She has a very large podcast related to her platform, which is foster care. Um, and she has an incredible story as it relates to her own, uh, journey 
to becoming a foster mom and adopting her son. Uh, and she's really incredible and she's certainly deserved to win for sure. That's awesome. And the, and the title was, it was for Miss International or is it something? Before yes. Yeah. No, or, Mrs. Okay. International. I was, uh, I competed to win the state of Illinois and okay. I won. And then that gave me the right to compete at Mrs. International. So you have to typically compete to win your state or country title to okay. compete. But people who, uh, one of the unique aspects of this particular pageant is if you have competed before and won your state title or your country title, you get the right to compete again as a regional title holder. So in this case, she was Miss Central States. I could go back and compete as Mrs. Midwest if I wanted to, because you've shown that you've met You've the criteria, met criteria and been there yes and because you can't you can't recompete for your state multiple times got it and then does it go to, and then you're miss is it then united states and then international or no it's just mrs international um and so huh. people win their individual states but also like we had a mrs australia we had a mrs a central asia but that's why it's international. There's, okay there was a mrs japan and a mrs um pan pacific is a, a title that kind of covers that peninsula and they were both crowned but did not attend because of travel restrictions so they'll compete next year Inter interesting well so you're part of fintwit you're part of the pageantry so you're part of a bunch of communities yeah absolutely working moms i have a five-year-old that's always interesting mm -hmm. uh i know he's done well most of the summer but i can see that it, this is starting to get to him um uh, camps have kind of started to close down uh, we were able to send him to camp. The problem is the camp he went to, we signed him up for two weeks. He had such a good time. We wanted to sign him up for more, but all these camps have very limited numbers. Yeah. Like this camp only allowed 15. You had to sign up for two week increments because they were not letting a lot, kids a lot of camps aren't even open to begin or with not even summer. in. And then, you know, having socialization, he, we live in a, basically a condo with no outdoor space and there's no other kids in the building. So he doesn't have really any social interaction. So the camp was great. And I, we went to visit my parents. He got to interact there. My husband took him to visit some family where he got to interact with kids his age. But the last few weeks he's kind of been stuck at home with a sitter. Uh, and while the sitter is wonderful, it's not the same thing. And he's the last few days he's really struggled. And he said he misses uh -huh. his friends and he misses playing with his cousins and, if I know there's a lot of debate about in-person school, but I can personally tell you that my son will not thrive if it goes virtual where we are. Right. Interesting. For sure. Yeah. Well, you sound like an awesome mom too. I do my best. I have my moments. Well, Hey, this was, um, this was great. Is there anything else that you feel we didn't cover that we should have covered that you want to bring up? Not particularly. I, I did mention um, I do a lot of work with financial literacy for women in the underserved minority community. Yeah. Fintwit's been great for that. I've been able to connect with a lot of people who share similar goals. Uh, Tyrone Ross is a huge proponent of financial literacy in general, but definitely for the underserved minority communities. He's been a tremendous resource for me to be able to develop and implement programs. And he himself has implemented some awesome programs. What kind, what kind uh, of programs? Actually, let's let's talk about okay. that for a little. I think that's actually right. awesome. Um, so what kind of programs are you been developing around that? So I've been working with rock the street, wall street, which is an organization that focuses primarily on high school age women, teaching them financial concepts, uh, and also introducing them to career opportunities. So going on field trips where they go to financial companies and meet women in different positions is specifically focused on getting young women involved in, the actual portfolio management analytical types of roles, not necessarily because one could argue that there are a lot of women in marketing and sales and things like sure. that. But in, in the analytical and the executive positions, not as much. I think we're only 6% of the CIOs out there are female. Uh, so the express purpose is to get young women on that track. I've also worked with Invest in Girls, which is part of the Council for Economic Education uh, on similar programs where they go into schools and teach young women. But then there are programs like Tyrone has created some financial literacy programs in cities like Detroit. And we've been trying to work together to do something here in Chicago where we go into the 
really poverty stricken, violent areas of the city and introduce these concepts because financial literacy really can change outcomes. There's a school here in Chicago in Hyde Park called the Ariel Community School, which is sponsored by Ariel Investments. John Rogers actually f helps with the funding of the school that starts financial literacy in kindergarten. Oh, wow. And the outcomes for those kids almost I think the percentage of kids that graduate from high school is well above average, especially for the community in which the school is, is pulling from. And the number of minority students, African-American, that come from the south side of Chicago that go through the aerial community school that then go into finance or law is also well above average uh, and not in line with other kids from the same community who didn't go to that school. So it can make a huge difference, not just in the kids, but also in their parents, right? Because yeah. they're going back and they're teaching their parents these concepts, concepts that their parents may not have known either. And that doesn't just help people with having better financial stability, but it also helps with health outcomes, educational outcomes, less incarceration rate, lower I mean, incarceration rate. I would imagine, rates, right, all if, of you, those things. if you have an understanding of things like saving and investing and basic financial concepts, you're probably less likely to join a gang. And it's right. not just saving and investing, although the investing in particular is how you build wealth. You know, people can save till they're blue in the face, but sure. investing is how you actually build wealth. But it's understanding economic concepts, how the world works around you, like how accounting works, building your own business, becoming entrepreneurs, yeah. um, having that knowledge to be able to succeed in the business world is important because if you think about it, it doesn't matter what path you take. Those concepts are really important in be able, being able to have success in any business. Yeah. If you become the CEO of any company, understanding accounting, financial statements, understanding economic supply and demand curves is super important. I'll say it's, it's also probably super empowering, especially at such a exactly. young age too. Mm -hmm. that's, that's so awesome. Um, yeah. Could I request if... Is there ways where I could put some kind of link in the show notes to any of these organizations that you're, you're part of? Oh, absolutely. Of okay. I can absolutely direct message you the links to those organizations yeah, for sure. Yeah, DM or email me and, you know, I want to get as much stuff in the show notes for then you to be able to post on Twitter too. Absolutely. Would be cool. happy to. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I'm See, this is why I always ask my guests, is there anything else? Because there's usually one or two things where just I get lost in these interviews and it's it's like, oh, yeah, of course we should have talked about that. So cool. Well, it's something I'm very passionate about. Yeah, so. I love it. And, it. and it makes a difference. One of the things I respect is that it's not just a talking point, right? It's mm -hmm. You're actually getting involved in the community. You're actually making a difference. And I love any anything like that I, I, I think is great. So happy to promote as much of that stuff as possible on the show, whether it's from you or, or you know anyone else. And I think we do a good job at it. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Yeah. Well, Shana, it was such a pleasure to have you on and I wish you the best with everything that you're, all the things you're up to. <laughs> um, and when, when do you think sports are going to come back? Well, uh, given the Marlins outbreak yeah. with baseball, that's not looking so promising. <sighs> and I am like, I'm going to be heartbroken if there's no football because I live for football. Um, who's, but who's that's your not team? looking so I'm from Boston. Okay, so you're a Patriots fan. I'm a Patriots fan. But I'm going to just let everyone know I am not a bandwagon Patriots fan. Okay. My grandfather was an original season ticket holder. In 1960, he had season tickets for most of my life. And most of his life, he died in 1995. They were atrociously bad. And so when he, um, before he passed away, my, he my dad was offered the opportunity to take those tickets and he turned them down and he has regretted it ever since. Cause I think he's been on the waiting list for season tickets now for like 15 years. I yeah. remember that. Cause when I was, when I was growing up, I had my, the first part of my childhood was in Miami. So I was a big dolphins fan and Dan Marino was my, was my guy and always remembered the dolphins were always better than the Patriots when I yes. was growing up. Yes, until Bill Parcells and Drew Bledsoe when they started to get somewhat decent. And they had that one season in 85 where they went to the Super Bowl and got crushed yeah, by the Bears. I wasn't born then yet. Oh, well, sorry. That was... I guess I'm a little older. Yeah, I do remember that. In in interesting. Now, Drew, Drew Bledsoe was kind of a jerk from, my, from how I remember. I don't, I, don't I met him once, and I don't yeah. recall him being a jerk at all. Um, maybe he was on the field, but he was pretty gracious 
uh, to fans. And maybe that was, my a, dad maybe used, was a Dolphins thing that we just always assumed. It could have been. My dad used to run a the community service division at the Worcester Police Department for years. And okay. every year he used to do an annual flag football game with what's called the Patriots Alumni Group. It was run by Fred Smurlis, who is a very well-known um, nose tackle for the Buffalo Bills, who has repeatedly been in the Hall of Fame list but never makes it through to that final round. But Fred Smurlis ran it. Um, he grew up in the Boston area. And so he would have this flag football game. It would be Worcester Police versus the Patriots alumni. And oh, Drew funny. Bledsoe was there once, uh, and that's how I met him. That's funny. How do you feel about Tom Brady leaving? I am one of the few Patriots fans that's not all that heartbroken. Belichick, really? I trust him implicitly, and Bill Belichick has a – extraordinarily good track record of knowing when to cut ties with a player. Can you name for me a single player he let go that you thought that went on to do anything no. amazing afterwards? No. No. See, I, th I think you're, you're, it's, you're, you're speaking now from a rational investment analyst. I, I do take pride yeah. in trying to be a rational person. My it. husband would argue that I am still – the Boston fan that expects negative things to happen. That's just growing up in the Red Sox always, you know, the curse, the Bambino, the Patriots yeah. were always yeah. awful. And the, the Bruins were okay. And the Celtics of course were great in the eighties, but um, you just grow up as a fan of the Patriots and Red Sox, you know, expecting the worst. And even to this day, uh, I do that, and he hates me for it because he's a big Broncos fan. Uh, but I remember watching the Falcons game, uh, that Super Bowl game, and at halftime wanting to just shut it off, and him being like, "What are you doing? It's Tom Brady." So was he an Elway fan? Uh, he was a huge Elway fan. His the first football game he ever saw in person was at Mile High. It was Broncos Raiders, and he was seven years old. And he grew up in Western Iowa, so at when you grow up in Western Iowa. Minnesota, Kansas City, Denver, and Chicago are all pretty much the same distance away, so you pick your team. And so his dad happened to know the kicker for the Broncos, and he got tickets, brought him to the game, and he's been a fan ever since. I mean, if your first game is the Broncos Raiders at Mile High, right. it's hard not to be a Broncos fan. I, I will tell you, as a kid growing up, watching uh, Elway on the Broncos, even though I was not a Broncos fan, they were a fun team to watch with, with him as the quarterback. Yeah, I was never a Broncos fan. But can you admit yeah. they were a fun team to watch, even if you? I never watch really them? watched them. Okay. Although I did watch when they won the first Super Bowl after they had lost so many times. Um, I that I think they played the Falcons. I did watch that. I was like a freshman in college. I think you're, I think you're right. Yeah. And that was a very fun game, and it was fun to see him come back and win and then retire. That's the way to go. I wish Brady would do that. Would have done that. A few, you know, because then we would yeah. still have <laughs> Garoppolo. A few episodes ago, I interviewed a former uh, Philadelphia Eagle, Winston Justice, was on the show, mm -hmm. and he he now works for uh, an investment uh, investment management firm too as a vice president. Very cool. Yeah. There's a lot of ex athletes that are in here. Um, Zoltan um, Mesco, I think that's his name. That? He was a former punter for the Patriots. He uh, he now is in the private equity world. Uh, and I know Joe Man Montana had his own hedge fund for a while. Did he really? And, yeah, he did. How my did husband likes to tell the story of my husband used to be the director of hedge fund due diligence at Morgan Stanley. He left the industry and runs a charity now. Okay. But um, he used to be the director of hedge fund due diligence. And Joe Montana had come in pitching his fund. And he has the football that he threw across the room to Joe Montana and asked him to sign. I was like, wow, that's so cliche, but he still has it. And he's very proud of that football. He signed it and everything. Uh, kind of a cool story for sure. How did his hedge fund do? Out of pure curiosity. It does not exist anymore. No. I think it was called like MVP investments or something to that. It doesn't know. It no longer exists, but you know, Bobby Valentine had a, worked with some hedge funds. Um, I think Jeter has some association with a hedge fund. Hmm. Athletes actually do tend to get involved with hedge funds, not so much in managing them, but in helping to uh, seed them and the like. They also get in trouble because they give money to scrupulous, unscrupulous people. Right. But uh, they do tend to get involved in the investment world afterwards, especially the really successful ones. Interesting. Well, last question before we go. Out of pure curiosity for FinTwit, what do you think of um, the that that Twitter handle, the Stonk Market or whatever her name is? 
You know what I'm talking about? Like I, Eloise Williams. Oh, she plays oh, this older oh woman yes, who, yes, yes, you know yes, yes, about? yes. I love her. I love her so much. She there's a couple of parody accounts. Ramp Capital's another one. Stock Cats is another one. Uh, there's some really good anonymous. She, she's my favorite. Funny. Yeah, I Ramp is probably my favorite. Ramp, okay. Um, that one's pretty fun too. Um, but yeah, I she's she's fantastic. I love. I love, I don't know who's behind it, but she I was feel just like interviewed actually on a really? pretty, it might've been market watch. It was a pretty big, uh, financial news outlet that interviewed. I think it's a dude. Uh, he's an, he's, an I was going to say, I, the, some of the things that are said are <laughs> definitely coming from a guy. You know, I mean, you never know, but it seems like yes. if I had a guess, uh, but he's an analyst at some fund. Um, he Fantastic. won't say who he is. And he, he was talking about entrepreneurship and that, the smartest thing he did was start start the satire stonk market website and he goes my big he's like my biggest regret is i didn't start it like sooner when i was like much younger well you remember goldman sachs elevator that was the original what one hap what happened to that he got he got outed and that ruined he wrote a book and uh somebody outed him and when he got mm. outed like that account kind of died but i remember oh. that guy and he was that account was one of my favorite followers i loved it. I, I, I love i loved that yeah. Who? So who was it? I didn't know. Who I think it. it was somebody that had a history and worked at one time with Goldman Sachs. I okay. don't know the whole story behind it, but I know, I do know that he got his identity was outed and that Ooh. ruined it. Yeah. Uh, like people who out these anonymous funny accounts are. I, I actually think that they they're just cruel. It's like evil. Cool. Actually, it yeah. is. It is because these accounts are bring levity and entertainment and you know fun to the platform and then when you out them you kind of ruin it for, for them everybody because, and there's yeah. no upside it's like why right right well on oh. that note it was great to it was great to have you absolutely and, um i'm sure we'll talk again absolutely it was a pleasure to be here all right and by the way if people want to people want to follow you on twitter what's your twitter handle it is shana s621 so my name is spelled S H A N A. Last uh, name starts with an S, and then six two one, and that is my Twitter handle. And we'll also put that on the show notes. And then anything else you want to send me, we'll just stick it right up. And uh, awesome. All right, great. Well, have a wonderful rest of your week, and uh, good luck with everything. Thanks so much. All right, take care. Bye. Bye.